I'm mainly be going to be focusing on this white nest, which was published by Quattro Books late last year. Uh, the book has four sections, and I'm going to give kind of a brief guided tour through the, through the sections and read a couple of poems from each of them. Uh, the first section is um, sort of writ large, um, uh, nature poems, but there are nature poems that are a bit weird um, in that uh, there's often um, trees inhabiting people and people being inhabited by trees and other natural elements. Um, so I'm going to start with the title poem. Uh, it is one of two poems in the collection that are riffs on an early John Ashbery poem, Some Trees. And my poem, like the book, is called This White Nest. This is wildness, breath awakening in field so it holds thirsty fire at dusk. Outside, our perception of walls a ripening in snow. Our absence of transparency, we stop, stunned. Thickness of simple silence, separate. Burnt after shattering, a wound. We measure fire's link, we mouth lines, gulp dust, touch, promise, speak. In trees illuminated against sky, one reverse image nest and another, each a distinct knot, but branch is joined to branch. They diverge in astonishment. You and I dwell in the dry sigh of grass, appetite glow, flames. What shines? Another poem from the first section. Um, gave rise to uh, the, uh, the uh, cover image, uh, which is repeated throughout the book. Uh, it's called, All I Am Dumb to Tell. Stems knot and grow along my veins, branches in gray-white landscape, low hills and lake, ache in my steps along boulders on the frozen road, Steps resonating up through my souls, a trudge in my chest. That frisson I feel, the shimmy of unreality in the way a tree trunk slants and bends, grows somehow inside, yeah. beanstalk push. Burls shape themselves in time lapse, make a sculpture behind my lungs. Shadowland. The uncanny is breath on back of neck. Voice of an unknown elder, my father's mother, perhaps, or some bad fairy. Spaces urging me to tell, to know, to probe. Shedding light creates shadow, and a single dry leaf pivoting on its stem pulls at a place beneath my ribs. A knot in my neck twangs when a muscle low on my back is needed. Fascia current hums within me, spider silk wispy and adhesive, tensile vines reach out. Hungry for daylight, they are etiolated, warped in growth to turn towards the shaded windows. Outside is blurred softness, like blanket edge. Not sky blue, but snowbank shadow blue, January afternoon. The crisp edges of wind-whipped snow dunes have dulled to rolling ripples, open-ended hush in soft pour. Light through bandy-legged clouds confections upon the clean expanse. Enigma opening its valves, spilling absence. It flows in endings and beginnings, untampable gush of emptiness. The softness a, sprung, a sponge brief comfort soaking up sorrow. But the surge continues. It blinds my eyes like tears while driving, some reckless plunge down snow corridors, wheels crunching, fenders scraping unplowed drifts congealed to pebbly slush. Windshield as fogged as my heedless vision, tunneling through the loneliness, worth gains and losses, 
toted, found to add up to a gaping space, emptiness fuller at the horizon, a wanting, wasting vein, unmined. Um, in this book, I return to uh, a lot of the themes that cropped up in my first uh, collection, nature, family, and a certain amount of loss and grief. But it's also a departure, uh, particularly in the second section, where a character I've taken to calling an incantatory every woman, often a little bit witchy and more often in some kind of peril, uh, makes her presence known. So uh, this is one of those poems it's called Bracelet Charm. She shakes out a bone bangle, wrist turned to show how the ivory blesses her flesh, a shape he sees as if kissed by lightning. X-ray vision against tattoo ink sky. Obsessed, he grabs for her hand, tries to insist. She won't be pressed. Moon crests the horizon, words are a twist. She fingers the jangling pieces. They whistle, then still. Bone cast incantation gives voice to her silence, a creeping of mist. And from the same section, this is called, why isn't this on the curriculum? Charming character turns creep. Bug-eyed, he assesses her strange when she opens her mouth. She is elsewhere, an ace-shaped arrowhead spearing towards her. Word duels edge embroidered with cruel work of calculating women. Their abacuses click off the odds. Does she survive or is her household, children, dogs, tablecloths, gone to slavers and brigands? Who barred the ligand gate short-circuited that neuroreceptor. Serotonin kicks in, curry combs the wild-eyed horse in her, mobs heaving ribs, lays on blankets, thick, heavy, absorbent. Why isn't this on the curriculum? How to resist, how to tamp a spear wound, be sanguine, unafraid, gray of gaze, wondering that she can be uninjured. She probes her ribs with two fingers, surprised that the fabric is whole, that her touch comes away dry. The next section is called All the Dorothys, and it is in large part both me celebrating and grieving my late mother, whose name was Dorothy. Um, at the core of the um, uh, section, and in fact, uh, this is the middle of the book, there is a long poem called Apples and Roses, and uh, it's too long to read the whole thing, but it uh, came out in a beautiful uh, chapbook that Rob McLennan's Above Ground Press put out uh, with an illustration by uh, the wonderful Manahil Gondakwala. Um, so in, in the long poem, I've surrounded my mother with other Dorothys, and in other poems in, uh, in the section, I've filtered aspects of her life through myth or fairy tale. So I'll read a couple of those. Uh, the first one is Apple Swoon in a Cider Press. Fog muffled Grimsby mornings, late fall snap of cold twigs, teeth imprinting fruit. You wear why daily, chase September's red-cheeked child ladder to law. Next year at this time, the barn will raise witness to itself. Beams of the season will brush blue sky, but can you build high enough? Quick color blocks, a quiet quilt, stitched together of smoky afternoons, stooks, stunted trees in patterns, apple barrel insides, smooth as slicked down clay. Next poem is called Enclosures, and it's in five short parts. One, broken, 
wing across her body in familiar gesture, protection, pain. From her tower window keens for the sky, captured by the young king she'd struggled in net, cried wordlessly, where was her voice? Then fell still. She learned to love how he smoothed her feathers so they flowed even. He'd hold her and her heart thrashed wings in that stinging net. Two, judicious yielding and children came, two daughters and a son, their very being a wild cry of love and distress in her. She forgot she'd once had wings and feathers, still ached to fly, no abdication, never could she think of leaving them. Three, a lack of weightlessness different from weight, drags, her sigh, braid of knotted silk strips dangling from her belt. Queen, mother, and could it be? Bird, former dancer, trapeze glider. Or human, she felt herself, but an icy layer of strange gelled air kept her from touching them, heart to heart, beak to beak. One day they lifted damp wings stretched out each feather. She showed them how to preen, root to tip, let feathers dry and fluff. Five, no need for her to teach flight. One by one, over her window edge, they went out and away. She watched, heart catching drafts they rose on, hoped they'd return without need for net. Uh, the final section carries over some of the grief from section three, along with family stories, more in the incantatory vein and a bit of ghostliness. Uh, this next one is one of the ghostlier ones. It's called Rickety. Our house with the sleep tangle still on us, the hymn sound of day begins around the open door. I live in my own head a child-sized shape shrouding my view, eddying curtain and flicked switch signal arrival, ghost dance of attention. Your long throat blew with kisses, a sheep mild protest. The air has an uncertainty to it now, a pond surface quaver. Antique wicker creaks under your slight weight, arabesque angles, sense of assembly, stone sequence chiming with heel clicks, scattered gravel. Next poem is called Penumbral. These days when it's cloudy, the sky is a series of hammered pewter links tethered to my heart, straining it out of my chest. I need to clasp with both hands so the muscular pump won't yank free and fly, riding the air current or bouncing off the high points, off fences, trees. So it won't drag red on the ground, catch on underbrush or trimmed hedges and tear itself to pieces. Blood moon was mottled by cloud that September night, hide and seeking at first behind curvy wisps then obscured by thicker banks. Propped against metal bleachers in the school playing field, we craned skyward, watching for glimpses. It was never red, but clot-hearted, shades of brick or rust, old blood, not fresh blood. Earlier, as we strolled after a film, the sky was clear and the moon was whole and large, line up at the gelato bar long, even this far past summer. So we didn't linger. We stopped halfway home to lean on a bridge rail, saw moon still set in blue plum swath, a blurred bite in her side. 